call Dr. Rungi. That makes me think of my dad. Uh, I... <laughs> well, I'll call you That's Steve it. from here on out. That's uh, yeah. But for those of uh, who might not be familiar with who you are and your work, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Uh, I was uh, raised Lutheran background, uh, went to boarding school, college, and didn't know the Lord. Ended up meeting some guys from Campus Crusade for Christ that explained the gospel to me after a series of personal things, and the gospel finally clicked. Um, got involved in a local church and was working in youth ministry, decided I wanted to get some Bible training. I'd finished my bachelor's by that point, started attending Trinity Western part-time, and, and over seven years, got a two-year uh, master's degree and saw things going on with biblical languages where people were starting to ask, why do we still need to teach Greek and Hebrew? Isn't this just kind of a hazing and, and people could make, you know, say it was really, really important to learn biblical languages, but when it came down to answering why, there weren't always really strong answers. And I, I believe that they were important too. So I, as a result of a short-term mission trip in 1993 to Ethiopia and looking at some of the things where people were moving away from the Masters of Divinity degrees into the Masters of Religious Education, um, I yeah, just a series of things it ended up the Lord laid it on my heart to have that be my mission in life to show, make a case for the, the value of biblical languages. My background through both of my grad degrees was framing houses. So I've got scars and, and laceration wounds and things from framing by myself over a period of 16, 16 years. Um, and so I bring a very practical uh, kind of bent to scholarship um, and Faith Life or Logos Bible Software was uh, kind enough to hire me in 2006 on kind of a trial basis to try out some of these ideas. And so we built some databases, marking up discourse features, published a Greek discourse grammar, and then have done some other kind of experimental commentaries. Uh, but I've been with them for 14 years as a scholar in residence. And it's been a, a great blessing to help build tools within the software that really wouldn't be possible in print, wouldn't be possible outside of that ecosystem that are there to help people who don't have uh, a, a much of a background in biblical languages as well for those that have advanced backgrounds to be able to better understand how to use Greek and Hebrew for ministry. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. So I did, I did some uh, research uh, on your background and uh, I just, I don't know, I don't have a background in construction, but I love someone who's able to go down a unique path and end up at Logos. Uh, it's just a, a fascinating story. And we're going to put links to your books and resources. Okay. Uh, in fact, I would encourage everybody, for especially our Logos users, to just do a search for Steve Runge. Uh, and it'll, it's R-U-N-G-E. Uh, but yes. I think 56 hits in the Logos bookstore. So, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite, the, um, quite the resume there. And then also, I, I want to just... Uh, promote the high definition commentary series on Lexham Press. Those are outstanding uh, commentaries. And you're exactly right when you say you've come from kind of that blue collar world where you're able to explain things. I'm not an academic, but when I read your stuff on linguistics and grammar and discourse, it makes sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're, you're doing, a, doing a great job. Well, um, it is. It's such an honor to talk to you. And up front, we always kind of ask a, a silly question. But Christmas is coming up. Do you have any pet peeves? And if you don't have a pet peeve, what's one tradition that's just non-negotiable? Pet peeve. I would probably say a fake tree. Um, I know there's room for them. Living in the Northwest, it's easy enough to get out. And either, you know, like for $10, you can get a forestry, uh, a National Forest Service permit to go cut your own tree. But that's that's a big deal. Black Friday is all about going and killing something. And yeah. for me, it's not ducks or deer, it's, it's a tree. It's a tree. Fair enough. And, uh, well, uh, the, no, fair enough. Mine is Pentatonics, the band. Okay. My pet peeve. Um, well, it, it is, it is such an honor uh, to talk to you. We're going to talk about a couple of things. One is discourse analysis, uh, and then also the Bible software, how you're using it. But discourse analysis, uh, you know, and you write to people in, in your book, your discourse analysis book, that I felt were like me. Uh, biblical languages are important. I've got four semesters of Greek. 
but mm -hmm. I wasn't familiar with a lot of the concepts that you had written of. That's not blaming my professor at all. He was fantastic. It was just, I was out of habit. So for those uh, uh, people who might not be familiar with the idea of discourse analysis, uh, what is it? And then why is it important that we think of things like discourse analysis? Okay. Discourse analysis, or what I, more specifically what I'm doing, uh, calling it discourse grammar, uh, meaning like writing a grammar, especially of, of uh, basically writing a description of things, especially those things that, that are operating above the sentence level. Um, most of the time when we're, you know, when you're learning Greek, most everything is geared toward translation. So your understanding of something is demonstrated by your ability to translate it into natural English. Um, but oftentimes there, you know, Greek is not English. It's like they have a different word for everything and they don't have the courtesy to speak in the way that we do in English. Mm -hmm. It's an old Steve Martin joke. But the idea is if, if we're trying to get at what the original writers were trying to communicate and, and to capture things where you have mismatches between how Greek and, and how Hebrew or Aramaic would communicate things in English, they would do it differently. It's really important that we use a framework that enables us to, to best understand that. So for instance, if you were reading through Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 5, if you were reading that in Greek, you would be reading one single sentence one complex, really hairy, gnarly sentence, but it's only one. Where if you read it in most any translation, it's two, three, sometimes four sentences long. And the reason why, you know, is, is Paul not a, a, you know, a gifted Greek speaker, you know, that he would write such a run-on sentence? And the answer is no. The way that Greek writers would use participles and dependent clauses and relative clauses and all those things that just made you glaze over when you were in high school English mm -hmm. are a way of structuring things in order to draw attention and focus our attention on certain things to direct it here as opposed to some other place. So if you read through that passage, you have in, in, in Logos, you can turn on the propositional outlines there's a the little, it looks up, up at the top of the, um, the screen, there's three little symbols, kind of like the Trinity, three, three, bot, the three spots filter. like the Trinity symbol. Yeah. Click on that, it'll be, scroll down a little bit, and there's a thing called propositional outlines. What that will do is indent everything based on the Greek syntax. So you don't even have to know Greek, you can just open up the propositional outline, and it will lay that down for you using, you know, kind of a, a, a indented so if, if something is indented it's it's indicating that it's dependent on on something and that dependency relationship so basically what paul's doing is he has one main verb and everything else is scene setting and drawing our attention getting our mindset in this particular way in this particular situation so that when he really pounds the pulpit the one main verb that you finally hit in verse five it makes us think about things in a certain way. And verses one through three are all about where we used to be before Christ, lost in our sins, um, dead, and wandering about and all these things. And then you have in verse three, where Paul says, where, where he and the Jews also were doing the same kinds of things as the Gentiles. Then you come to verse four and you have, but God, and it's being rich in mercy in, with which he loved us, and then it, almost a verbatim repetition at the beginning of verse 5 is where he started up in verse 1, which is being dead in our transgressions. And what's that one main thought that he has? It's he made us alive together in Christ. He could have just as easily said, you were dead, you were lost, and God is rich in mercy, and he made us alive together. But that would make it sound like all of those are equally important because they're each main clauses. But by making one main clause and backgrounding all the rest of that, it draws our attention. It's almost like you're, you're waiting for the punchline because you haven't come to the main verb. And that's, but, but Greek structuring of things like that is not how we do it in English. Yep. And I'm not saying we should translate in a way, in a way that, 
that isn't like English, mm -hmm. but that's where these other kinds of electronic tools can help you kind of have it both ways, where you can have a natural English translation, but still be able to get at some of the structuring, the rhetorical devices, and most importantly, the prioritization of the information that's going on in Greek. No, that's, that's fantastic. I use that uh, propositional outline to work against some of my technical commentaries. Okay. Uh, and you're exactly, you know, Paul, he will in English have a famously run on, or in the Greek for us, a famously run on sentence. And it really does. It highlights those main things that you're supposed to, to work out. And it uh, challenges me in my sermon prep. It, when you're able to see those right. things, it says, oh, these are the things that Paul wanted me to really be concerned about. And kind of like what you said, come to that, come to that pulpit. Uh, the same thing with the visual filters for the imperatives and the participles. Yeah. Yeah, it will Visual open up your world. Great tool. Yeah, great, great tool. Um, <clears throat> very good. So as you've done a lot of research um, in the area of discourse analysis, have you ever had any moments where you learn something about the text that alter your view, kind of what we call an aha moment, where you just kind of come and almost like your world was opened up of, oh, I had never seen that in the text before, and we kind of miss it in the English. I mean, probably the biggest aha moment I had actually didn't have much to do. Well, it, I guess it did. Um, this summer, I had a chance to teach uh, through Ephesians. Let me uh, open up to the passage. I had a chance to teach through uh, kind of an advanced Greek uh, course to Ephesians for seminarians at Shepherd's Theological Seminary in North Carolina. And I was preparing for the class, reading through, and I, I kept running into both, the word both in um, Ephesians 2. So uh, you have the same kind of a Paul in, in Ephesians 2 taking you uh, the second half of, of Ephesians 2, taking people back to where they once were. Therefore, remember that you were formerly Gentiles in the flesh, uh, you know, as though somehow they're not Gentiles anymore when we think about them from some other standpoint, um, which is really interesting. But he, you know, like doesn't elaborate on that, keeps going. Um, you were called Gentiles in the flesh, the so-called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Um, that you were apart from Christ, alienated from the citizenship of heaven, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. So you have all of these kind of outsider specifications. Um, but then he talks about verse 13, you have this switch, but now in Christ, you the, who are the ones who are once far away have been brought near uh, for he himself is our peace who made both one and broke down the dividing wall. And, and when I've read through this, I don't know how many times I've typically assumed that the reconciliation that was happening was between me as this Gentile, formerly, you know, separated, apart, no hope, stranger, that now I'm reconciled with God. Mm. But there's no way in, in both both are reconciled, it can't be talking about Gentile and God. It has to be some other group. And so, again, looking at why is he talking about outsider, insider language, and he's talking Jew-Gentile here. Mm. There's, there's no way around it. Um, and that is, as you come down to verse 13, but now in Christ, the ones who are far away, the Gentiles, have been brought near. So as he's talking about near to what? near to the Jews. So no longer are they outside, no longer are they aliens. He's not talking about coming in on a green card or being some kind of illegal uh, plant that, that's, that's come into the, the people of God of Israel, but he's talking bona fide people who are full citizens, who have all the rights and privileges, um, and, and they're no longer separated. And, and why is that? And he says, um, because They've been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace. He's made both one. And that was the mind-blowing thing. Both wow. one is Jew, you know, 
we're used to, they're no longer being Jew Gentile. Um, but as he as he talks later, uh, well, for he himself is our peace, the one who made uh, who made both one broke down the dividing wall, and um, and I thought I was crazy here that this is you know if you if you read any of Mike Heiser's work, he, he draws a lot back to Genesis 11 and the dividing of the nations, um, the handing over of the nations to the other gods and, and raising up a nation for himself and the people of Israel through Abraham. And, and throughout the, the prophets, we have this expectation that God would redeem the nations, reclaim them to himself, and make one people again. But that's the super secret mystery of the gospel. That, you know, as you read in chapter 3, he talks about this. That's been hidden since the beginning of time that you finally get to see. And it's that the gospel is what enables the reconciliation to happen. And that it's, I don't think this is just talking Jew-Gentile, but I think the kinds of struggles we've been facing this summer as, as a nation over racial reconciliation, that the gospel is that thing that finally enables that to happen. Mm -hmm. And that without the gospel, there is no hope, which is exactly why we see what we see going on in the streets. But at the same time, for those who are, who are believers in Christ, you know, the same kind of dividing wall that was broken down for Jew and Gentile that kept people separate is the same that I think that same mandate we have today for reconciling. What does that look like? I don't know. But in terms of the the animosity, the the just choosing to live separately, the choosing to live kind of a separate but equal existence, there's just not a room for that in the gospel. And, and it's been, you know, kind of shattering. And, and I thought I was crazy doing this kind of reading. So I went back to J. Vernon McGee, you know, which is back into the uh, what, late, late 50s, early 60s for some of, the, some of this exposition. And he's laying out this, you know, you can go to YouTube and actually read his or uh, listen to his audio recordings. And he's tracking in the same kind of way in that, you know, he, he's talking here. About it's, it's not a, a matter of the Gentile being brought up to the Jew it's or the Jew being brought down. It's it's more that you have this new level where the two are are one in Christ. Wow! Um, but that's been the most uh, you know kind of teeth shattering or you know jog you know this jarring moment of of what else have I missed yep. and what else have I you know based on this kind of lens of of viewing everything as about me my personal reconciliation to God when Paul's clearly laying out. Uh, a bigger message that has something to do with this side of eternity so that we can all be presented as one man to God, uh, not this being taken care of in, in, in eternity. Oh, that that's fantastic. I forget where I heard it, but I heard someone refer to it as the mystery of the gospel is that God makes a new humanity and that yes, we're literally a new people, no longer Gentile, no longer Jewish, but we're a new people in Christ. And that, that, that bringing back together is something that, that's been separated since, since the Tower of Babel. Yep. No, fat. Oh, that's, that's so good. Yeah, no, that, that's, so, that's so, so good. Well, someone, let, let's say we've got people who are listening who are going to feel overwhelmed. They probably just are saying amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, as they're listening or watching to all the things that you, you said. But when we begin to talk about discourse analysis or even outlines in the text, um, and they feel just overwhelmed because they, they don't, that's not their world. What's a way that you can encourage them to say that this is, this is kind of like, where do they start uh, to kind of get their feet in the water and they don't have a background in it at all? Yeah, you mentioned the high definition commentaries at the beginning. Um, it was kind of an experimental commentary series. Uh, the, my mandate from Bob Pritchett, the uh, CEO of Faith Life Corporation, basically came in and said, you said discourse analysis is, is so valuable. Write a commentary my mom could use in her Bible study and, and put pictures in there that would help, help illustrate the points. Yep. And he kind of sketched it out on a napkin and left. Like, 10 minute meeting after lunch one day. Uh -huh. And I think the napkin came from lunch. Um, so I took like a couple weeks, started figuring out what would that look like, drew some pictures, did a commentary. We did a sketch of Philippians, I think it's something out of Philippians 2. Mm -hmm. um, did a sample, like 
five, six paragraphs, a couple of pictures, and kind of threw it up on pre-publication where you can, that's how Faith Life will, will put books out to see if there's interest. And normally those pre-pubs take, you know, sometimes a month or two, sometimes six months, sometimes they, they never have enough interest. We posted that thing about four, four o'clock, came in the next morning, and it had all the orders that were needed because of the interest in this. And we hadn't had many prepubs that had that kind of interest. So if you are interested in kind of a, a folksy explanation of Greek based on how my mom would call me down to put the peanut butter away or things like that, um, this would be probably, you know, if, if this doesn't capture your imagination, I, I don't have much else for you. Um, but the Philippians commentary or the James commentary uh, there's a new one on, on Galatians as well that doesn't have pictures. I'd commend one of those to you. And if that if that sparks a mist, especially if you've taken Greek in the past, you've had a Greek at some a year of Greek at some point, but it's it's got really rusty. These um, resources were were written with the rusty the rusty Greek student in mind to help encourage them to to come back and start using those tools again. Um, the goal isn't to, to be able to read a, a clean, a, a toolless, uh, you know, Greek text without any helps. The goal is to just help you better understand what's kind of going on under the hood, especially um, with some of these devices that aren't really um, covered in seminary, but are, are really helpful in terms of understanding, you know, how the writers are directing our attention or prioritizing things. Oh, that, that's great. And two things on that. One is that shows the value for people who are the Bible software users to go ahead and purchase the pre-publication stuff. That helps get books out there. And then yeah. also anybody who's thinking about these commentaries, if you don't have them, I think they're all under $20. They're very reasonably priced uh, for a commentary like this. And they're unique. Um, you know, I, I always think, uh, every person needs almost two ca uh, kinds of commentaries, one that is towards the seminary and another that is towards the pew. Um, and this kind of bridges the gap that does something unique, uh, but it makes it accessible. Um, so yeah, th those are great, great ways to get our feet into the water. Well, kind of switching gears, uh, just at a, a personal level, you know, you, you spend a lot of time in the text. This is could be somewhat of a loaded question, even though it's not, because I think we have so many good Bible translations. But what's your favorite? And I know that could mean you're probably going to say for what, but what, what's really your favorite Bible translation? I, I mean, I, I think I've traditionally liked American Standard because it's helped me understand the structure, but some of that, that appreciation for the structure in Greek or Hebrew has to do with having taken Greek and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, the so some of those the the more wooden translations can end up being off-putting because it it doesn't really sound like good english and it's yeah. it's not it's not meant to be the lexham english bible the same way it's meant to be like a scaffolding to help display information in the resource um that you know to mimic as much as possible the greek or hebrew structure mm -hmm. um so especially if, if you've had some background, um, you know, you've taken some Greek or, or Hebrew, those can be useful. Um, I, I like some of the paraphrases as well because of how it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. So the, the New Living Translation, um, again, you'd say maybe it's more of a paraphrase, not a translation and debate over that, but the, the bottom line is it will help you think because it's more of a thought by thought translation instead of a, a word but word for word translation it can basically provide a a whole new kind of snapshot idea of, at the higher level that i would have missed otherwise and it helped me slow down and think back through things mm -hmm. um so kind of going to, you know I, I tend to be kind of an extremist in that sense and and it's kind of operating at those those two extremes and, and having some things that are going to challenge the mediocre. I, I do like the NIV a lot in the sense that it provides, um, I mean, when I, when I saw my mentor, Stephen Levinson, when we were arguing over something, he would kind of go to the NIV as a, uh, a tiebreaker, so to speak. Um, and so 
NIV can provide a, a helpful um, in terms of how they've structured the, the phrases, it's, it's um, structured the clauses. Yeah. That, that's been another one that's been useful. But it really depends on what you're doing and what your background is as to which is going to be most helpful. We're really in the golden age of Bible translation when you think of the history of the church. It's just such a blessing. I, I love almost all of them. I can't say I love all of them, but right. uh, the ones definitely done by committee and by people who know what they're doing are just, you know, all, all those translations I think have their purpose for the Christian. Right. Like, like you said, it really depends. What, what are you using it for? And uh, so great answer. What's your favorite book of the Bible? My favorite book of the Bible, it would depend. I would say today, <laughs> uh, I think it really has to do, uh, boy, the Desert Island Bible book uh, would probably be Romans, but I think at the moment, just really pouring back through Ephesians and really feeling like I've misunderstood the gospel. I've tended to think of the gospel in a four spiritual laws kind of sense. Right. Um, and, and I think there's a tendency to think about the gospel as a transactional thing between an individual and God. Right. And you have other voices like N.T. Wright, who can be thinking, you know, broad strokes, much bigger, you know, the, the salvation history kind of idea. And, and there can be a, a, a tendency to like push that off and say, no, that's, that's too big. He's reading something in. He's, he's you know, where is the, the transactional individual thing? And then I come across passages like, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, and especially if I read Ephesians 2 as setting the stage for Ephesians 3, mm -hmm. um, that, that Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 are not the end-all be-all, that that salvation that comes about by grace through faith is just simply to put me in that situation so I can finally experience and help be an ambassador for the reconciliation that God's wanted from the beginning of time. Yep. Then it really is not about that transactional thing. It's about getting into the game because of the transaction yeah. to, to do this, this broader ministry that God's always intended, but that we, because we tend to divide and separate just as the Jews did, we're not doing anything different. That's, you know, we have, we have a long heritage of dividing and separating, whether it's denominationally or whatever else. Um, that 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 is not God's heart. So I'm spending a lot more time in Ephesians lately, just to really make sure that I I I in a more holistically read the book and understand the book and correct those things that I've been been missing based on that transactional individual preoccupation about the gospel. Oh, you're you're so right. And if uh, for everyone listening, we're going to interview. I've got the privilege of interviewing uh, Dr. Matthew Bates from Quincy, who's written so you know I think his stuff on this is Salvation Allegiance, and then he's got his book, Gospel Allegiance, and she writes another one. I think Scott McKnight with King yeah. Jesus Gospel uh, yeah. is just knocking it out of the park, and you're so right. We have that Reformation. The church has always been a pendulum, right? Like, uh, and, and, so, and we're always reactionary. Um, and so, you know, please no one get mad at Martin, uh, at Luther and Calvin and the Reformers. Oh, man, what a blessing uh, to the body of Christ, and yet everything, when you look at their context, is this pendulum. And so I'm thankful for some new voices who are really taking us away from that four spiritual laws. Um, even though that's part of it, pers I, I believe in yes, personal salvation, but it's a limited view. I would say it's connected to the gospel and not the gospel. And that's another podcast, but I love what you're saying. All, all that is ringing true to my heart. Well, uh, what authors, maybe both academic, you know, people are always looking for book recommendations. What, uh, what authors, both academic and pastorally, have, have left a strong influence on you? And you've, not, you've already named a, a couple. Right. Um, I, think, I think more recently, Mike Heiser's work, so The Unseen Realm, uh, Supernatural. Um, I really did not do much in, in seminary about um, Second Temple Judaism. And, you know, I was like, I'm just going to focus on the Bible. Why would yep. I want to be reading these non-canonical texts? Yep. Well, it's because the writers of you know, it seems at the very least it informed their worldview or it gives us an idea. So when we come across these weird texts like First Peter 3 and Jude, they're like, what are they talking about? Um, gaining that background that, that is, we talked about that, that assumed knowledge, um, you know, that, that shared knowledge that we have 
what was that? What would that look like for them? Mike Heiser's work is a really important, fills in an important piece of that. Besides archaeology and sociological things, yep. um, I think in terms of academic books early on, some of the the literary um, the Jewish writers, so Adele Berlin, Robert Alter, Shimon Bar Frat, um, these are now kind of getting dated, but I think that um, I, again, I I didn't spend much time in English or English yeah. literature. I was yeah. not trying to get in touch with how a, how a, a sonnet moved me in terms of poetry. Um, I didn't really learn how to read. So a lot of what I'm doing now in grammar is catching up for what Mrs. Williams and um, Dr., uh, you know, Mr. Gillette were trying to get me to do in high school that I just yeah. had no interest in. Um, <laughs> no, so, that's great. Um, Adele Berlin's Poetics and Interpretation of Biblical Narrative. She's not a believer, um, but she's a practicing Jew, uh, teaches comparative literature, or used to, I think. She, maybe she's um, retired now at University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. But just fantastic respect for a close reading of Scripture. And essentially all that I'm doing in my work in discourse analysis and discourse grammar is taking some of these literary ideas and, and running them through a linguistic lens to uh, better understand how it is that God's wired us to process these things and why it is that they bring, bring about the responses that we do. No, that's great. Uh, that's yeah. fantastic. And I've got to ask, what's your dog's name? This is Tilly. Tilly McCutterly Chocolate. She's a Springer Spaniel, a tri-colored uh, Springer. And so we, we tend to name our animals after food just to kind of keep them in their place, let them know where they are, uh, but also uh, just for fun. Yeah, and no, that's what I see. Here. Chocolate's my favorite ice cream. Okay, no, I, I see Tilly walking in the background and uh, wanted to ask. Well, let's talk just for a moment, and I appreciate your time so much. The Logos Bible software, uh, people are always interested in someone like you, how they use it. So how do you use the software in kind of your everyday life? Like, how are you using uh, Logos Bible software to further kind of your walk with the Lord? Right. Um, I think probably most of my reading now is electronic. I used to have, um, I mean, I was a, you know, I had my New American Standard Bible and I would take notes and then I would go and try to find them. And I, I had no idea where they were. There was no way to find the notes. Um, I'm not a good journaler, so I never developed a strategy for filing notes away and being able to find them. It tended to be things like like envelopes and pieces of yep. paper and things like that that I again I, I couldn't find them again I, st I still do that I still have sticky notes all over my monitor but using the notes feature especially when they blew up the notes and you didn't have to have them in notebooks um, I can read something I can take a note on my iPad um, I can underline something in my iPad and when I show up on my desktop two years later I can find it or I can search electronically and do search all my notes and be able to find them. So it's brought um, insight where I can have a conversation with 2009 Steve because I had this idea and I don't, I don't, if, if I disagree with myself now, I can just add a new note that says 2020 Steve sees this and this is where I am now, but now maybe in 2024, I can have another conversation with myself that I, I wouldn't have had otherwise. So the note feature has been incredibly helpful. I think the, the things like, you know, as much as I've, I've written and published in Greek, my vocabulary is not as good as, as what you might think. So using things like the sympathetic highlighting where you can grab the Greek text and find the English or, or um, you know, highlight the English text because of the reverse and linear alignment, um, that's been very useful for me. Um, I'm not sure what the feature is called, but the parallel Bible version, the multiple resource view or multiple resource display feature. Um, I'm reading more in Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that's so where I can open up a display and have Greek and English and potentially Hebrew there to be able to compare things. The visual filters, as you mentioned, I use, they're, they're on all the time. And I have to turn them off when I'm when I'm teaching because it's a distraction. It's my own little world that I've created, but it's been very very helpful to to make it where I don't have to rely as much on or I can test my parsing and and double check things. 
the new fact book that, that's been released in Logos 9. Um, that's something I worked on, but it's also I worked on so that I can use it. Um, and, and that's really helped consolidate data sets that had been kind of siloed. And you'd have to remember which data set is that in the Bible sets lexicon or is that over here? The discourse data sets, the, the new fact book in Logos 9 basically brings all of that information together in one place. Even doing a word study, I can go to the Lima page about something and see all of the different things that I used to get in Bible word study and Bible sense lexicon or in the syntax database. All of that is in one place um, and, and be able to, to see that, scroll through that, and then take notes on it. And again, to have conversations with future self, um, past self, and, and have that all consolidated. All, all the selves. You're exactly right. I've got some friends. I'm not schizophrenic. They, they, I'm they've really got not. Logos 9, and they thought the user interface is the same. And But the more that I played around with it, that fact book is a game changer. It's like the whole, the, uh, the engine of the vehicle got a huge upgrade. And as soon as I was able to search grammar and lemmas and have all this information, you know, so I could do a right click on a word and search that kind of word within uh, fact book, it was just a game changer. Uh, but it's like the Ephesians, Ephesians 2.14, the breaking down the wall, that was a lot of what was going on under the hood is breaking all of those kind of silos of the data sets and bringing them together. And, and that's something that you're going to be seeing, you know, going into the future to, to um, synthesize more and more of that information into something that, that's bigger than, than what they are individually. Wow, that's fantastic. Steve, I want to thank you so, so much for sitting down with us. This has been an absolute uh, joy and privilege. I hope to talk to you again uh, in the future. And it's just been wonderful to get to know you. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's been a privilege and wish you the best. Merry Christmas and uh, look forward to talking again. That sounds good. Well, thank you everybody for listening or watching. I'm going to put all the links in the description below uh, so you can buy uh, some of Steve, Steve's books. Brave Daily at its heart, we are a Logos Bible software coaching outfit that has some of these author interviews and book reviews. Uh, you can go to our website at bravedaily.com uh, to sign up with the coach. And if you have questions about discourse analysis, uh, grammar help, uh, prepositional outlines, all the things, we'd be more than happy, uh, more than happy to sit down with you and uh and go through this and until next